Welcome, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Dave Liu, co-founder of Real8. We share the stories of struggle and success behind iconic creators responsible for entertainment we love and focus on people who are underrepresented in the traditional entertainment system. By sharing their journey, our hope is to inspire you to support them as well as encourage you to create. Today, we welcome Bao Tran, an amazing filmmaker who was mentored by master action director Corey Yoon. He has worked on films such as Cho Lon, one of Southeast Asia's highest budgeted action blockbusters, and Jackpot, Vietnam's official entry to the 2016 Oscars for Best Foreign Film. His first directorial debut was The Paper Tigers, which was praised by Variety and The New York Times. Welcome, Bao. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Dave. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. So, like every great franchise film, let's start with your origin story. <laughs> um, you said publicly that your family originally came from Vietnam with the fall, fall of Saigon and immigrated here to the U.S. Tell me a little bit more about your family journey and how your heritage influenced who you became. Well, as you mentioned, uh, my family came uh, post-Vietnam War, I guess, uh, after the fall of Saigon in uh, late 70s. We came to the States and uh, I was the, I guess you would say, the first of my generation to be born here in America. So depending on scholars, you know, no one has been able to really pin down definition for me, whether this first generation 1.5 or 2, but I don't know what it, it all means. But the point is, I was the first of uh, my family to be born here in the States. And uh, so that was kind of an interesting uh, upbringing because you had older siblings that, you know, were born in Vietnam, but also are, you know, starting to acclimatize themselves to uh, here in, in the States and they're able to speak English fluently. And then you also have fam uh, parents that are, you know, working class, but also, you know, trying to learn English essentially as a second language. You know, the courses were called ESL at that time. And so that's, a, you know, it's an interesting, you know, bicultural household because you're speaking Vietnamese at home, but, you know, also sp speaking English, helping your parents translate, helping, you know, all those things along and trying to make friends and fit in at the same time. So that's kind of a, uh, you know, I don't think it's very exceptional, but I think it's a, maybe a story that not most America is quite aware of, uh, but you know, it's a very common experience for any children of immigrants. And what, what did your parents do in Vietnam and then here in the US? Uh, my father was like a professor. He was a, like a teacher of uh, English and linguistics in, 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 in school. Um, I think it was like secondary school, what you would call you know, high school. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he, uh, he basically, you know, was fortunately was able to kind of like uh, have an English foundation when he came to the States and then help, uh, you know, uh, get the family, you know, its footing, at least with an English background that helped a lot. Uh, and so, but, you know, he ended up working as a janitor when he was in the States, you know, he already started working on very blue collar jobs uh, to, you know, to, to kind of support his family. So that's um, something that very much kind of seared in your head if you're a child, uh, this type of um, immigrant experience of, of, of of basically having having your hopes and dreams, you know, dashed by national uh, politics and, and and world events. And is that is that anything new, you know, now in this in this day and age? Uh, but it's a very common thing. But you think about, you know, he was probably about like I want to say 38, uh, 37, late thirties uh, when he when he eventually moved his family uh, here. So you think about those chapters in your life. You know, how much have you developed and and established yourself and and built a career and built your family? at that age and suddenly to have to have it all pick up and, and start all over again is very, very dramatic, very dramatic and traumatic, I'm sure. So those are kind of like an interesting uh, questions that we always kind of grow up with and kind of have that weight, the burden of responsibility, if we will, for better or worse, to kind of like make those sacrifices uh, worthwhile and live up to, to the things that uh, your family had, had, had given up for you to be able to achieve. So when you were growing up, uh, kind of in your middle school, high school period. I understand you grew up in Washington. Uh, were you one of the only Asian kids or was, it, was there a lot of diversity in your class? Uh, depends. I think there were a lot of Vietnamese. Uh, there are two chapters. I grew up in Olympia, Washington, which is kind of like capital city of, uh, of, of, of Washington State, but also because we had our family, my uncles, their sponsor family. So, you know, all those communities kind of like brought uh, the immigrants closer together because, you know, you had the sponsors so that there's kind of that chain uh, migration where all the families were able to kind of build community through that. So we weren't dropped in as strangers. We knew each other. We knew this person or that person. Uh, so there was definitely that. And then, oh, this person goes to that school and oh, they're in that school district. But so we always have like 
Vietnamese events, for example, like weekend uh, Vietnamese language schools was a big thing uh, for the community to be able to support and have their kids like be tutored and start learning, you know, the rudimentaries of Vietnamese language, uh, reading, writing and spelling and all that stuff. And so we did kind of like have that experience, but also we saw each other at school. You'd been working on a film. You effectively mm -hmm. had it in the can. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was when you revealed to your parents, hey, I think I want to give this a go. And by the way, here's a finished film that I made. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, uh, I think it was, it was, it was VC. It's Visual Communications at LA, Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival. And they had my short film with their, you know, I basically got a letter of acceptance or something. Yeah, you know, basically I had a screening. I was programmed for the festival. So I definitely had this bird in hand and, uh, you know, be able to kind of tell your family that I make movies, but also people like it and people want to show it. And, and so you kind of have that, you know, in your back pocket. So yeah, that was kind of the whole process. I didn't, I wanted to wait till graduation because it really, there wasn't to be said to me until then, to be honest, because I knew I had to get a degree. And that was cause just kind of family understanding to have a degree and have a, even as a fallback career and and then and then have something that you can have that stable if i were to be dropped out of college or you know didn't even start college then i think that would have been a huge issue so to me i kind of played the long game and said I'm, i'll do this i'll do this four years I'll hunker down for, hunker down for four years and try to get this computer science degree no less uh and and graduate in that but also try to so try to make some inroads into filmmaking did, did your parents or your family watch the film yeah, yeah, they liked it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it all worked out. But there's, there's all the questions like, yeah, it's cool. But, you know, can you make a career of it? You know, and those are all those are all the gnawing questions. So, you know, that's that, that that to me is what I started to really kind of start to understand. It wasn't necessarily, you know, against the arts or anything like that. It was just kind of like, well, what can you make of it? Maybe, maybe you can just give us a little more color on how you transition from being a fan of film to really a student of film, because there's a lot of us who watch a lot of film. I certainly watch a lot of film, uh, but I don't know two cents about like how to make a film. So maybe you can just give us a sense of how you made that transition as you were becoming a filmmaker. Yeah, I would say, again, just to kind of set the, set the scene, to have a video camera is really groundbreaking. And by that, I mean a video camcorder, not necessarily a Super 8 camera or anything, which is all great. Uh, but, you know, for some cosmic circumstance, you know, I was born in this time where this thing was just starting to come in technology. And so I think that technology was a huge uh, way for me to kind of like jump into that. And maybe we take it all for granted now with cell phones that take videos and, you know, you can edit and stitch and do everything on your cell phone. But imagine at a time where there was a barrier of entry to even make films because you had to get the stock and you had to go film. And so it's a very expensive and the whole prospect of going to film school is, you know, very daunting. Um, so that, I'm just saying that just to set the scene. And so for me to be able to even have a inkling or a spark of an idea that I could even make it uh, started essentially with videotapes, essentially with um, TV and watching, uh, you know, going to Chinatown and mom and Asian mom and pop shops and getting these videotapes or sharing videotapes with family members and swapping, you know, we'd have these all these movies and TV shows that were from Asia. And that was kind of our lifeline to Asian culture and, and be able to watch this together as a family and, and see movies and the latest, uh, you know, entertainment uh, that was going on, you know, across the ocean. And so I was watching all that stuff growing up, Bruce Lee especially, you know, huge Bruce Lee fan and very much like you, like watching it as a fan and just being enamored. And so for me, Bruce Lee was definitely as, as an image of a movie star, but it wasn't anything that was like, I could do it or that I could try to like, you know, uh, figure out what he was doing. It was just so, he was just so, so much of a, a comet, you know what I mean? You're like, you can't catch that comet. Actually, it wasn't until I started seeing Jackie Chan um, for some reason, just some light bulb um, turned on for me because he has a certain type of filmmaking style or s it's very tangible. The way the rhythm he uses, the choreography, it's just a very musical, accessible thing. And then I just really was fascinated by that because I just wanted to start to tinker, you know, underneath the hood. How does it all work? How does the cut work? How does the framing work? Because he just had the perfect like concept of filmmaking not just martial arts ability, which is fantastic, but the filmmaking and shooting and, and editing of that was so fascinating to me. So I, I, I don't know what it was. It was just musical to me. It was like music to my ears, literally. If you close your eyes and watch his movies, you can hear the sound effects and there's a certain tempo and a rhythm to all that. 
So yeah, that's when I started to kind of like really wanted to understand what that means. And because of that, you know, you had a VHS deck, you could pause it, you could record, you record it and dub it and watch it again. Let's go slow-mo frame by frame. You could do all these things now just in sitting at home if you just know how to use your VCR. And so that's how I started to learn how to make films is actually, you know, filming on my camcorder and then editing between two VHS decks. And you start to kind of like figure out how the wires, all those, you know, whatever, all that uh, white, ye uh, yellow and red cables, all that means in the back. And you start to figure all those things that it was very much self-taught, you know, mind you, this was before Google or any any like tutorials that you could do, you start to figure out what all that means.